I'm lyrical, and that's all there is to it. Uh, I happen to, if I have to put a label on on, on myself, which uh, I'm not a, a big fan of labels. Um, I, I'm glad that, that Bill mentioned, you know, the different kinds of black music. So do I represent a particular school or kind or anything? No, I'm just a Dolphin Sam store. Um, lyrical, a cultural hybrid, because half of my training took place, or maybe the most formative years when I was young, took place in an Anglican cathedral in Albany, New York. And I didn't know that there was supposed to be some essential cultural difference between what uh, blacks did and what whites did. I just wanted to be a classical composer. I just loved classical music. And uh, first recordings my mom ever got me were Beethoven Ninth and Mozart uh, piano concertos and all of that. And I loved the Barbara Adagio. I was swinging over that. Uh, as a kid, and I, I, I love Tchaikovsky, uh, so all of that. And um, I never thought that I would be, uh, you know, there was not this definition at that time, an active definition of the black composer and all of that. And in fact, I remember asking my mom, well, you know, where are the black composers? Well, I think I'll do that then, because if that's, you know, the, what is it? Find, find, a, uh, find a need and fill it. Um, and since there weren't any black composers, a parent at that time, I said, I did not know the work of uh, George Walker or Ollie Wilson or who was only a few years older than uh, I am. So um, all of the uh, wonderful black composers that were working at that time. And um, I realized, however, that what they did, I mean, for instance, um, what T.J. Anderson was doing was not what anything for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, that's not my style. And um, so I said, well, I'll just have to find my own way and try to blend everything I've loved into my work. And that's what I've done. And sometimes, now here's what I always tell everybody, Sometimes I'll write pieces that have absolutely no African-American content at all. Yeah. Sometimes I'll write pieces that I try to exclusively use African-American materials. Sometimes I will seek to blend African-American material to the two sides together. And sometimes I will juxtapose them. Okay? So that's who I am. Just a, a conglomerate and a, a stew. Uh, music making, who just loves writing music. I, 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 I didn't march, and I've never marched in any uh, uh, protest parades or anything like that. Though students who were walking, were in, in Washington, D.C., where I went, got my bachelor's, were breaking barriers downtown Washington. I did not even know it. Mm -hmm. I didn't grow up in a segregationist uh, area at all. I never went through segregation. I never went through Jim Crow. So uh, the, the, this whole idea became only apparent to me as a, a, a problem for African-Americans. When I say, hey, I'm an African-American, uh, that uh, I realized that when I got, we started working on my doctorate at Michigan State, I got to Michigan State in 68, and all hell was breaking loose. And, um, Kids were doing sit-outs, the, uh, the, the, the black students were, were, were calling for teach-outs and all this other stuff. And I would go to some meetings and I heard the thing that's been kind of a guiding philosophy. Guy got up and, and, and they said, you know, you know we, we gotta find our own way to contribute to the cause. And each person using his or her talent can make a contribution. You don't. You know, if, if, if walking down the street, you know, carrying a sign is for you, then you do it. Uh, if, uh, but then I decided the thing for me to do was to take my art uh, and, and, and try to um, make a statement with that. And so many of my pieces, just as the one Bill mentioned, um, uh, were geared towards representing or talking about or speaking about addressing the triumphs of African-Americans as well as the tribulations 
of African Americans. Yes, yes. That's what I could do because I had a, I had a, a, a hand in both worlds. And I said jokingly say I walk I walk both sides of the street and uh, and, and and that that's all there's to it. Yeah, well, there's actually more to it. Um, there's been some academic writing uh, and review of you as actually uh, bringing forward uh, into the 21st century uh, the iconography of William Grant Still and how William Grant Still brought the black story in, uh, in different levels uh, into his own music, symphonically, vocally, etc. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, the operas, of course, uh, in, 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 uh, notably in particular, uh, Troubled Island, and I think, what is it, Highway 101 uh, deals with lynching. And so there has been a precedent for that. And, and it's, I am just delighted that you have really, in many ways, taken that forward. I mean, when you look at um, the, if, if I can be so forward to say this, so if we're looking at the foundation, foundational idea of the African-American composer working in uh, the late 30s, 40s, 50s, we're talking about William Grant Still, and then by, you know, the late 50s, early 60s, we're talking about George Walker, and then we're talking about Adolphus Hellstork. And I feel that in particular, between the three of you, I think that truly you have, uh, in your own way, of course, just as William Grant Still did in his own way, brought the importance of storytelling, of being a story griot for uh, African-American history and the African-American voice, even though that has never been, as you're saying, your focus, but yet it is on some level uh, the lived experience of your work in many ways. Yes, we recognize, as you're saying, that your work you have, uh, for example, what is it, the, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment here, but the work for oboe uh, and chamber orchestra, the, the um, Sonata di Cesia, there are a whole range of of chamber works that do not uh, speak to yeah, or bring up an idea about African American experience, but yet there are those that do, such as Dunn Made My Vow, uh, in particular, um, um, among others, uh, the symphony, it's the symphony, the second right. symphony in particular. So there's a lot, it's very interesting. Um, and to that note, um, I would like to uh, now share the screen again and to share with you uh, what I call a premiere uh, suite. Uh, I've been very fortunate in the past year to be working with Dr. Hellstork as his marketing agent and to have been privy to yeah. some wonderful uh, new music that is essentially not known to most people here listening in. Um, and I've created essentially a suite of from three different uh, really wonderful tone poems that we have a chance to listen to. And you will hear this idea that is both uh, what George Lewis talks about in a New York Times article about a creolization, but you will also hear the unique voice of Adolphus Hoylstork bringing forward, again, uh, from my point of view and others, this really iconic tradition, this the modern America, the great American symphonist tradition forward into the 21st century, but with a particularly, and as they call it, a black, brown, and beige emphasis in, in many, especially in the works that we're going to hear. So I'm going to go uh, do the sh share screen, and uh, please enjoy. Again, if you have earbuds or, or uh, headphones, I think you'll hear more in the music, and then we'll come back after we, uh, for more conversation after this is done.
That for me is the glorious, great, grand 20th century uh, American symphonist tradition brought into the 20th first century through the lens of great composing. I am absolutely, as Adolphus knows, since I was there at the last piece, I, I still, uh, it is stunning. Uh, it's a stunning work uh, on so many different levels. Um, in particular, the ar this archetonic idea, this sense that you bring to these tone poems uh, is just fantastic. Of course, in particular, I just love the use of the anvil strikes and in particular, that glorious, glorious uh, block scored chord in the lower strings. Um, I, it has a particular meaning for me, but I won't mention what it is, um, but it is absolutely uh, referential, uh, but yet uniquely Hillstorm. And I, that is what I so much love about this. What we heard were a uh, composite uh, from uh, Dr. Hellstork's private recordings, which I use in marketing. Okay, so what we're using, what you just listened to was a, a suite uh, made up uh, from three different tone poems, all tone poems that you likely do not know. Most people think of a Hellstork, they think of the uh, Spirituals for Orchestra, the American Port of Call celebration. Those were uh, newer works. Uh, the, they are um, Hercules uh, from and then the second one is Zora, uh, We're Calling You, and the third one was Still Holding On. Um, all of them are glorious. I hope you enjoy them. And the floor is yours, Adolphus, because definitely um, they are works of great genius. Uh, I am honored to uh, market them. Um, I am brought back to when I was a cellist in high school, uh, and I was discovering uh, through the library and through the radio, uh, the iconic works of Roy Harris, William Schumann, Vincent Persichetti, and others. But this is uniquely yours, and I am just, just so proud to be able to market them. So please, the floor is yours. Well, um, let's see, it began with um, Hercules. Hercules. Now, I always like to joke around when I introduce that and say, how many of you know who Hercules is? And a few timid hands go up and they say, well, it was something to do with Greek mythology and all that stuff. So, and um, I said, no, Hercules was actually the name of the cook of George Washington. And, and uh, if, if you ever get to um, a tour of George Washington's home in Virginia, You'll see in, uh, in one of the displays a picture of an African man uh, in, a, uh, in a chef's outfit. And I, I was struck by it. And then I found out, oh, this was the most famous chef in the original 13 colonies. Wow. Um, he was so great, other, other owners wanted to have him. And um, you may uh, know that at that time, the only way you could get away is if you got into uh, Pennsylvania and um, uh, Pennsylvania said any, any, any uh, slave could be set free. We don't, we don't do slaves here in Pennsylvania. But um, Washington kept them under firm lock and key. <laughs> and... Um, and then Washington did get the hint that Hercules wanted to leave. When he was in Philadelphia, he was so great as a chef that he was allowed to go out in dandy, non-slave outfit, walk the streets and sell his wares, whatever was left over from the banquets he prepared um, for uh, Washington's uh, home. Uh, when Washington always had people over for fabulous feasts. And uh, he was allowed to keep the money. And he was getting a real taste of freedom. And uh, Washington realized that. And um, when it got the next time they had to go back, because they could only stay there six months. Six months, the guy was going to be free. They went back to Virginia. And Washington was so angry because he had heard rumors that Hercules wanted to escape, that uh, he put Hercules out in the fields with the field wow. hands. 
Now, now here's the top chef in the colonies told to go pick cotton. And uh, it came around eventually that it was time for Washington's birthday celebration and Hercules was nowhere to be found. And no one ever saw him again anywhere. And uh, he had slipped the plantation and all kinds of rumors that he wound up in France because even the French wanted to have him on their staffs. Uh, but anyway, I was so struck by this that I decided to write a piece. Uh, David Lockington was about to leave uh, Grand Rapids Symphony. He was the one who recorded my second and third symphony so, so wonderfully. And so I said, I'm going I'm to write a gift for you, uh, David. And so I wrote the Hercules piece. And they, they did that. And um, it, it, it was, that, that was an ex, it's just an exciting story. The next piece, Zora, was commissioned by the Orlando Symphony. Um, Zora Neil Hurston grew up just a, not a far distance from Orlando. I forgot the name of the town, Eaton. Yes, right. Yeah. 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 Eaton. And um, they wanted to celebrate her. And they got a commission together from, oh, from Catherine Pabst, I think, who uh, was a descendant of the Pabst family, the beer family, with a good gobs of money. And uh, she put up the funds for it. And I wrote this piece. Actually, Evelyn, um, I forgot the name of the librettist. The woman who was reciting as the librettist. And uh, Elizabeth Van Dyke. Elizabeth Van Dyke. Very, thank you, Bill. And she was an actress, but also a playwright. And so uh, she prepared this text. And uh, we had a, I had a lot of fun doing that piece. And, um, it, and uh, it was premiered in Orlando. And, and I believe that if you look hard enough, and you, you could Google that and hear it all the way through. Um, I know I, I did one day. And, one of my, and, and um, the last piece was uh, Still Holding On, which was commissioned by L.A. Philharmonic. And um, that uh, turned out, to, uh, I, I, I did, I've spared no, no, no mercy. <laughs> I said, hey, this is L.A. This is one of the top orchestras in the world. Uh, I just could allow myself to uh, uh, kind of be expansive. And I, and they, they wanted to, they said they were saluting William Grant still. And I took the word still and I used it in a double entendre and, and, and still holding on with a few quotes from the Afro-American Symphony by William Grant still uh, uh, in that movement. And um, we didn't actually get to the very ending in the in the excerpt you heard. Um, the very on ending purpose. has a on purpose. A, <laughs> as a short coda, which is also serving as a transition because yes. the uh, it has a, a C E flat F uh, notes that uh, are in the timpani, and those are the exact same notes I used to start the second movement. I decided to use that as the first movement of a symphony. And uh, so I, I, I still holding on uh, with a light touch of humor for the second movement. So you could, you, I had to relieve the tension. There's a lot of tension on the first one. And then uh, while still remembering the Emanuel Nine and many others, it's a slow movement. And then finally, still crossing that bridge, which I think I'm gonna dedicate that one movement to John Lewis. And, nice. yeah. um, and, and then there's a, a, a coda that is uh, a time for healing. Uh, and uh, that will, and it ends softly, the only one of the symphonies that, that ends softly. So, and it's symphony number four. So uh, that's, that's what's going on in my life. And, 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 and Bill honored me by just putting it all together in a nice hodgepodge. Okay. Well, yeah, I am, um, you know, well, well, you know, you, I think you know my heart. Uh, I grew up, good Lord, um, I wouldn't know what to, where to start other than to say that in uh, late junior high school, excuse me, I'm going to add one more person, uh, admit one more person to our show. Um, uh, God, I grew up 
uh, in a house. I grew up in Los Angeles, but my family was from Philadelphia. My parents were devoted uh, lovers of music, classical music, but in particular music by African-American performers. My mother was, before there was the term groupie, uh, she was a devotee as a teenager of Marian Anderson. My father was at Mass Mountain Conservatory and uh, a, a lesser known conservator of music uh, to Curtis. He was there in 1937. He, uh, got, well, he uh, graduated top of his class in uh, classical flute and in jazz saxophone. He was a tenor sax. Bring forward into, good Lord, into <laughs> my youth, my growing up, just completely immersed in music, especially in by high school. I think I was just so into this mid-century, um, when, especially when we got our stereo, our big council stereo that people, if, if those of you who are old enough to remember when Fisher and all of that, you know, it was a big deal to have in your living room, these big, these furniture piece. Good Lord, when, you know, the, K, the radio station for LA was uh, KDFC uh, and, excuse me, K, what, KFAC, excuse me, KFAC and KUSC. And I cannot tell you, you know, discovering Roy Harris, Copeland, David Diamond, your, your, uh, your, your mentor, uh, plus so much more. I mean, I actually went to the library as a teenager and checked out, this is, uh, this is dating myself, checked out the records. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, when you could borrow records and check them out from the library and brought them home to listen to. I was just very excited. So coming to you uh, in 2000, basically, to, you know, as early as what, 2017 at the African American Art Song uh, Alliance, the 20th anniversary one at, uh, at UC Irvine, um, I had already, you know, this whole wealth of, of exposure and appreciation. So it is a great honor to be able to have put that together. Um, and on that note, so we're hearing as you, I, I, it's, for me, it is quite clearly uh, a work, works of genius. Um, uh, as a marketing agent, if there was any chance um, that we could get the uh, professional master recordings of each of those works and get the permissions to release them as a DVD or CD, uh, that would be my dream for you, uh, Dr. Hellstar, because uh, they're brilliant works. Most people only think of American Port of Call or uh, Fanfare uh, for Amer uh, Fair, excuse me, Fanfare on Amazing Grace or uh, Every Time I Have Feel the Spirit. Some people will know of the Second Symphony in particular uh, or American Guernica, but these three works uh, must be performed by leading symphony orchestras uh, in the country. So I want to say that to you. So I want to go on talking about the idea of, of this, if you will, uh, taking the iconography of William Grant Still, of how Still used uh, music, uh, traditional uh, Western classical music, yet brought African-American or Negro themes to it. Um, there is another work, in particular a work from 2000, called Done Made My Vow. Uh, which is a major work. It's a, a major cantata. I should actually let Adolphus speak to that. We're going to listen to two excerpts that are, are blended um, by an audio a video house I use. Um, and it's, I will just uh, let Dr. Helstor speak about them first, and I uh, will tell you more later. Okay. Uh, Done Made by Val was actually written and oh, premiered in 1985. I see. Um, for uh, the... 50th anniversary of Norfolk State University, which is an HCBU. And um, did I say that right? HBCU. Uh, HBCU. And um, I, I think when, uh, when they decided to have a concert and they wanted a piece uh, that saluted their achievement of having gotten that far, um, uh, they wanted, probably thought they were going to get a little anthem. I wrote a 45 minute cantata called Dunne by Val. This is anything but a little anthem. Calls for a big, big, well trained choir, um, uh, uh, um, a tenor soloist, a soprano soloist, a child uh, soloist, and a narrator. And um, it's. Uh, 
Well, there's quite a story behind it. And, and, and so anyway, we, we premiered it in December of 85, the only time I conducted that thing. Um, wow. that, that, well, <laughs> it was, well, first of all, it is a tough piece. And um, the people who did it the most after its premiere were based in Detroit. And uh, a, a wonderful choral conductor of the name, Brazil Denard, yes, uh, fell really in love with it. And, yeah. and Detroit had a classical roots program. Right. And um, shortly after it was uh, uh, premiered uh, in, in Norfolk, uh, it got in the hands of Brazil. It, it's been done other places. David Lockington loved it. David, who is now at Pasadena. Uh, right. Loved it. Um, he, David would go to the extent of forming choirs uh, that, and, and training them himself. He was an English chorister coming up. And uh, so he could do that piece. Um, so uh, it, it has gone, it, it, now there's a story about the text. The text I chose, there, there's a climactic, an inner climax uh, that uh, has the um, uh, a quote from the I Have a Dream speech by MLK. Well, um, that, was, that worked fine for years until the King children, of course, said, hey, he was not a public servant, so his um, words are belong to us, and we should be able to get some money out of it. And so um, my publisher wouldn't dare touch the piece with, uh, because of that. And then um, a skinny guy uh, of mixed parentage came along yes. uh, who was as eloquent, almost as eloquent as MLK, and uh, said some fabulous things. So I decided to change that climactic uh, inner moment from King's words to, Mark, to Obama's words. And um, the publisher went gaga and said, uh, yeah, that's it. That's going to be the solution. And that version is available on YouTube uh, by the Lawrence uh, University uh, School or Lawrence School of Music. That's available uh, to hear on YouTube. Um, but anyway, that's the story of that piece. It was my first gigantic piece. It, it takes 45 minutes or more. And um, uh, uh, people still recall it fine, fondly, though lately it has not been given um, uh, re, uh, performances, probably because it's very costly. So uh, um, I've had conductors after that, uh, after they heard it, said, gee, why don't you write something small? I mean, at least for smaller forces. And that's why I wrote, I will lift up my eyes. And that took off, like, <laughs> like really took off. So um, uh, it, that's the story about Dunn made my bow. And it, uh, it is, I, I, the subtitle is A Ceremony. And I tried to cast it as uh, a quasi-religious uh, or church service uh, so that um, the, the, the speaker says, come acquire wisdom, straight out of the Proverbs. And then at the end, when, it, when it's, winding down just before the grand coda, uh, he says, go acquire wisdom. And it's addressed to the students, uh, cling to learning because that is your life. Mm -hmm. Observe well, yeah. okay. So that is uh, done made my vow. It's, it, it's a piece I'm very proud of, uh, even though it is challenging as so I'll get out. Okay, so well, that, you don't hear me say, okay. Okay, thank so you. Oh, absolutely. We're going to listen to it. And I just wanted to comment. Um, I think I can publicly say this, uh, Adolf. Um, I spent a lot of time last fall marketing this work um, because I believed in it so strongly. It is uh, a major work, but it has a, and you'll hear this. You're going to hear both, you're going to hear an edited uh, version uh, specific to certain uh, time periods of the MLK text and then the Obama text. But the choral writing, everything about this work is so timely for a time beyond the division that we are currently experiencing. It is an extraordinary work and you'll hear that. Um, 
And so I saw something different as well. And Adolf knows this. Um, I saw it in particular as a iconic tribute to two important landmark uh, civil servants who are civil rights who were civil rights leaders in their own. The late Elijah Cummings, Congressman Cummings, and I, I marketed this very specifically to the Baltimore Symphony and to the National Symphony in DC, and then also for John, for Congressman John Lewis, way before uh, it was announced that he was, uh, you know, had essentially terminal cancer. Uh, and there's quite a bit of story that I will not talk about publicly about the um, challenge and, and the resistance to that by an orchestra that uh, should have embraced it immediately. And I'll leave it there. I've been being very, very diplomatic, <laughs> if you will. Um, I know a little too much, if you will, when I'm doing this kind of uh, marketing work. So we're going to listen to, to, to two YouTube recordings uh, that are edited. The first is actually edited by one of our uh, participants, uh, Professor Timothy Holy of North, I hope I get this right, North Carolina Central uh, State University. Did I get that right, Tim? Uh, it's North Carolina Central University in Durham. Excuse me. Sorry. Thank you. Well, I knew I was getting close. Anyway, so Mr. Professor Holy has taken uh, what is actually a CD recording uh, that was a celebration of the music of Adolphus Hale Store from 2000 that it was done as a Baltimore Symphony um, special fundraising uh, set. And it features, uh, of course, the Baltimore Symphony, uh, conductor Daniel Heggie, the Morgan State University Choir, led by uh, the late Dr. well now late Dr. Nathan Carter, director. Uh, the narrator is Dr. Harold A. Carter Sr., uh, Janice Chandler Soprano, Gregory Hopkins was the tenor, Darian Caulfield, the boy soprano. Uh, and as I said, again, this was done by, uh, uh, this was put together. There, are, he used, uh, Tim used quite a bit of interesting imagery in it. So you'll hear that. And then it goes immediately into uh, what Dr. Hellstorp referenced, which is the Lawrence University uh, Choirs and Symphony Orchestra recording uh, an, an evening of the work of Dr. Hellstorp that was performed in 2018. It's under direction of Stephen Seek, who's a conductor. And in this particular performance, it showcases uh, students that were uh, music students of, of Lawrence University School of Music. And the, in particular of note is the narrator, a young black female who does a wonderful job. Uh, her name is Paris Wicker. So let us go into, uh, into uh, uh, share screen and we'll come back afterwards. Again, if you have headphones in particular, there's a difference in the sound quality and this will be the case with a couple of the tracks I'll be showcasing. So if you have earbuds or headphones, that might be helpful. Here we go. Let's, uh, share. Guilty of escaping from slavery and returning like Moses to lead her people to freedom. Du Bois, Marcus, Malcolm, Randolph, and Philip. Guilty, double guilty, of organizing a union and of standing up to a president of these United States, forcing him to put blacks to work on the home front while he was sending them to kill and die on the battle front. Parks, Rosa, guilty of not moving to the back of the bus. Martin. Guilty of believing in a dream. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing 
that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must come true. So let freedom reign from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom reign from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom reign from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom reign from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom reign from the capacious peaks of California. But not only that, let freedom reign from the stone mountain of Georgia. Let freedom reign from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom reign from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom reign. When we let freedom reign, when we let it reign from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day for all of God's children. Black, red, and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and say in the words of your Negro spiritual. and vision to become president of these United States of America. It is the fundamental belief that I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. That makes this country work. It is what allows us to pursue our individual dreams and yet still come together as one American family. I am not talking about blind optimism. I am talking about something more substantial. It is the hope of slaves sitting around a fire singing freedom songs. The hope of immigrants setting out for distant shores. The audacity of hope. Hope in the face of difficulty. Hope in the face of uncertainty. The audacity of hope. In the end, that is God's gift to us, the bedrock of this nation. We affirm the greatness of our nation, not because of the height of our skyscrapers, or the power of our military, or the size of our economy. Our pride is based on a very simple premise, summed up in a declaration made over 200 years ago. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator by certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like, Hope is the bedrock of this nation. The belief that our destiny will not be written for us, but by us, by all those men and women who are not content to settle for the world as it is, who have the courage to remake the world as it should be, brick by brick, block by block. Together, ordinary people can do extraordinary things because we are not a collection of red and blue states. We are the United States of America. And in this moment, we are ready to believe again.
Um, I'm sorry for that uh, the performance was interrupted by someone's background. But it's a great work, and this is a, this is why I think, especially in the in this uh, the the version you just heard, the Obama version, this recording, this performance has so much to it. This is why I felt really, truly, that there could be no greater tribute to the late congressman's uh, at that at that time it was just one Elijah Cummings, but certainly for John Lewis. This is a work that deserves to be showcased um, in their tribute. And I am just so, so, so uh, happy to be able to share it. You can hear more of it uh, by going online. Um, there, is, there are obviously two full editions of this. It's a 45-minute work. But I just wanted to um, uh, just share that. I think it's a great work. Adolphus, do you want to say something more about it? Just listening to the um, the Obama version that I just know uh, <laughs> made it seem so timely for the current it's moment. It's hugely timely. It's I, hugely. I said, "My God, this is this is exactly uh, the kind of thing that that works at this particular time." It's like uh, if there actually were a convention, this would be played at the convention. This it it it, it works. I mean, I'm not. It's not my you know, my writing, it's, it's his words. And they, I, I, I'm so glad that uh, he came along in, 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 in so many ways. Uh, but I was, just, uh, 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 I was just floored by how timely this is, that's all.